Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti. Today I'd have the pleasure to be discussing with you this concept called DNA cloning. And as the name implies, it's sort of taking DNA and replicating it, but it's not just replicating it, it's transferring it into from one organism to another. And it's, uh, you know, hyperbole alert. Uh, needless to say, it's significantly important in biotechnology and I might add personally it's in, in, important because uh, my lab in particular works in DNA cloning uh, as I'll try to allude uh, in the video. And so the development of these techniques uh, for cloning involve recombinant DNA technology and that sounds sophisticated but basically it just means to recombine DNA or genes from two different sources, often different species. and. Uh, that may seem r remarkable, but we've been doing it since the 1970s, and so I, um, obviously we've perfected it since, but uh, quite incredible. So in vitro, in other words, like in a, in a tube, we're able to combine DNA from one organism and splice it in to another organism. So it's sort of like cut and paste. And so it, it's still remarkable to me, the technology, and it's even more remarkable that, that we're actually you know, doing this and there's some profound, significant benefits uh, that, that are outcomes uh, as a result of this. So basically this is kind of genetic engineering. So it's what we mean by that, uh, hopefully that doesn't imply something negative, but ba basically what we're doing is it's the direct manipulation of genes for practical purposes. And so uh, we're intending on moving the gene from one to another for uh, for a particular uh, purpose, and so let me just start right out of the gate with a uh, with one of the great triumphs of uh, DNA cloning and genetic recombination. And so, biotech labs have been able to isolate the gene for human insulin. As you can imagine, that that's pretty significant in its own right. But then we've been able to transfer that human gene into a bacterium, which then reproduces very quickly. And all the all the descendants are similar. So thus, the, when the bacteria clone themselves through binary fission, they'll actually produce because of the common genetic code. They'll actually produce human insulin within them, and then bacteria can then be broken open, and that human insulin can be purified. And so, how do you like this? Insulin is now available for all diabetics who need it, and it's totally life-saving. So that one example alone has saved, I don't know, countless hundreds of thousands of lives. And so it's, it's pretty significant. And so uh, in the last uh, 20, uh, 15 years, we've seen uh, a huge uh, increase in biotechnology and companies and pharmaceutical companies um, employing thousands of individual scientists trying to make useful products as a result of that. Just to name a few here around the Bay Area, one of the more famous biotech companies, Genentech or Gilead Applied Biosystems, and of course BioRad. And so um, quite huge achievements. But I just wanted to say, uh, being able to do what we're doing, in other words, transferring DNA and, and uh, recombinate, recombination, the idea of sort of breeding uh, organisms is not new. It goes back centuries, of course. And so breeding uh, uh, grapes, uh, breeding uh, cows and, and other types of livestock to increase milk production or meat production or the manipulation of organisms to produce larger corn. Uh, and I, I put it as an example here, as if you can see, all of the selective breeding that has led to the different uh, breeds of dogs are an example of our ability to selectively allow some organisms to reproduce and others not, or and in horse horses as well. And so, what we're trying to do is, uh, in my lab, is we, we try to uh, isolate genes from redwood trees by isolating and uh, extracting the DNA from those needles and then basically uh, move them and transfer them into bacteria. And see, you know, why would you do that? Well, basically the bacteria will then grow with the redwood DNA inside and therefore clone and make many copies of that DNA.
And so hopefully in the video, I'll also address some of the reasons why you might want to do that as well. And one of those reasons why you might want to amplify DNA or clone it, uh, in addition to agricultural reasons, you could use this uh, for in criminal law. Um, obviously, a, a criminal doesn't leave a lot of evidence, sometimes more than others, but uh, even the smallest amount of evidence, like an epithelial cell or what have you, uh, the DNA can be amplified and then cloned and then analyzed through agarose gel electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting. And so um, for law, law enforcement, it's really important. And really for basic research, such as uh, sequencing, for example. And so in order to, to get the DNA uh, magnified, we use, and this particular video won't go into the detail of that. If you're interested in this detail, you can look at another video. But I do want to mention briefly something called polymerase chain reaction, in which you have a big uh, dollop of genomic DNA, and if you're interested in a particular area, you can apply specific primers to that area and target it. And then through thermal, uh, through the use of a thermal cycler, you could actually make many copies of that just that one particular area and when I say many I mean millions of copies of that particular area um, quite remarkable so this is all in a test tube and so um, the techniques for gene cloning uh, need to start off with that DNA so you need to start off with many copies of this template or the or the gene of interest and this could be again a human gene for insulin or anything that you want to study. You want to make many, many, many copies of that. And then once you make many copies of that, let me, let me draw a little arrow here to this. Say you made many copies using PCR, then what you'd want to do in order to get it into a bacteria, one way to do that is to splice it into a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA that bacteria normally possess. And if you could if can I, I'll use this as a as a verb. If you can ligate your foreign DNA into a plasmid and then put that plasmid into the bacteria and, and allow them to take it up, when the bacteria normally reproduce, they'll be able to mass produce that particular gene. And so that's what the cloning is all about. And so every time the bacteria reproduces, uh, the recombinant plasmid is going to replicate as well and pass it on to its descendants. Thus the idea of clone. And so under suitable conditions, and, and we know that bacteria like certain kinds of conditions, like 37 degrees and lots of food, um, we can grow them in large sort of vats like this and mass produce them. Uh, so they could, they could produce a protein, any protein we want them to produce by putting in foreign DNA. And then it's up to us to purify that protein. And there's an, a variety of ways that you can do that through uh, chromatography. So the basic concept of cloning kind of begins like this. You could take uh, a eukaryotic cell right here, for example, crack it open, extract the DNA. And again, this little arrow seems very simplistic, extract the DNA, um, but that actually could take some time because what, in, in addition to extracting the DNA, you want to purify that and remove some of the histone proteins and remove some of the RNA, et cetera. But if you can get purified DNA extract, then theoretically you could splice that in, and I'm gonna go into detail in a moment. You splice that into a bacterial plasmid, and then this thing acts as a, as a vector. Then you get it to go into a new bacterium, in other words, a transformation. And then those cells divide under optimal conditions, as I mentioned a moment ago, and so you get many, many, many copies of that particular bacteria. And so what are you going to do with that? Well, there's a variety of applications. If you're, if you're talking about protein, that particular bacteria could be producing, for example, human growth hormone for those individuals who have stunted growth. They could be producing a protein that's particularly um, profitable for pharmaceutical companies, which is helping to dissolve uh, clots in coronary arteries to prevent heart disease. Uh, and then if you're talking about just the gene in general, you, what you could do is you could splice those plasmids into corn, for example, and genetically modify corn. And again, this isn't really a video discussing the, the ethic of it, <laughs> but whether or not you could do it and, it, and it can be done and it is being done. You could splice this in and genetically modify corn, 
to be pest resistant, which then reduces the need for uh, pesticides on the crop. Or you can get the bacteria to actually metabolize um, oil and therefore clean up some oil spills if necessary. Or just for basic research, it's important. And again, I mentioned insulin, but another uh, protein product that's particularly useful is, is human growth hormone. And so you can treat uh, individuals with stunted growth, and that's particularly important. And so in, in my lab, what we're trying to do is uh, amplify redwood DNA so, uh, so that we could actually sequence it. So that's another thing, using the genes uh, sequence. And it's like, well, why would we do that? Um, we do that in the lab because the particular gene sequence uh, is, is relevant to us because what we're trying to study is the genetic uh, diversity within a particular population, for example, a grove of redwood trees. And so we want, we're interested in how diverse the trees are. So we look at these genetic marker sequences. And one way to study them and sequence them is clone them up so that we have enough uh, DNA so that we can actually uh, make that valid. And so we're, we're you know, the, the thought is the more genetically diverse the grove, the healthier it is in the, in the long run, especially against uh, potential germs in the future or climate change. So how does this recombinant DNA take place? How do we clone uh, DNA? Well, largely it has to do with a, diff with a class of enzymes that we discovered in the late 1970s, early out of M MIT. And you might be familiar with them. They're pretty, pretty important. They're enzymes capable of cutting DNA. And so they're sort of molecular scissors in, in cycle. It seems odd that a cell would have such an enzyme that would cut DNA. But if you're familiar with this, that bacteria have them in order to cut viral DNA because, you know, silly as it may seem, but bacteria can even be infected by viruses. And so they use these enzymes to cut foreign DNA. And so they're bacterial enzymes. They're different kinds. So it, that's the nature of an enzyme that they're really specific. And so different bacterial strains have different restriction enzymes. The reason that they're called restriction enzymes or endonucleases is because they cut DNA, not just free willy, but in a particular site. And I'll get into that in a moment in more detail. But they cut or hydrolyze DNA at defined areas producing fragments. And so th that's the basic uh, tool in gene cloning. You've got to be able to cut your material up. It's sort of like, you know, um, primitive editing, you know, before the computer, you'd <laughs> you get pieces of paper and if you wanted to, to move one paragraph to another, you'd cut it and uh, like literally like glue it in. And so in nature, bacteria use these enzymes, as I was mentioning, to fight off against phages. And so they recognize short sequences and they make cuts. And you might be wondering, how does the bacteria survive having such lethal kinds of enzymes that would cut DNA? but they protect their own DNA by tagging it with little methyl groups in a process called methylization. And so they have an enzyme called methylase. Uh, for example, as shown in this diagram, the, the bacteria would mark its own DNA with methyl groups, and therefore the restriction enzyme would sort of pass that particular area and not cut the DNA. And so uh, a little detail, but Here's uh, how restriction enzymes are named. Uh, the title of the restriction enzyme is based on the uh, first letter of the genus of the bacteria that it was isolated from, and then uh, the first two letters of the species for which it's isolated. For example, one of the more common restriction enzymes uh, that, that I'm familiar with is something called uh, ECO-R1, and that comes from E. coli uh, strain 1. Okay, and so as you can see here, this is a picture of a plasmid. This happens to be a plasmid called P. Glow. Um, it has it's called P. Glow because inserted in this plasmid is a is a gene for the green fluorescent protein. But also in this plasmid is ampicillin resistance over here, and there's obviously a site for origin of replication. Everywhere you see these little red lines going across the plasmid are areas in which different restriction enzymes are capable of cutting. And so uh, that's particularly useful, okay? And I just want to talk a little bit about how they cut. 
the DNA. And so I mentioned before that they're very specific. And so that specific area that they cut is called a restriction site. And often the restriction site has uh, the nucleotide sequence running in opposite directions or often complementary. In other words, they're often palindromic in nature. And so in other words, it would spell the same thing forward and back, sort of like the word race car. You can sort of flip that and it'll spell the same thing. And so the restriction site, when the enzyme comes along, it recognizes that palindromic sequence and it actually makes a cut, a, a covalent cut in the phosphodiester bond uh, between the, the nitrogenous bases in the sequence. And so that targeted area um, is then cut and, and then you can take that piece that you've cut from the, from the rest of the DNA, let me draw it out like that, and you can then take this piece and then splice that piece, if I can change color, splice that into a plasmid. And then the plasmid acts as a vector, sort of like a mosquito is a vector for uh, transmitting malaria. This plasmid is then a vector for then putting it into a bacterium and then the bacteria will replicate with that plasmid, plasmid inside. Now what's curious about this is I went over that kind of briefly. I'm like okay the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA and then it, you stick it in there. Well in order to stick it in there um, what's fascinating I, I believe about these restriction enzymes is that often, not all of them, but often they cut uh, in, a, in a particularly interesting way, meaning that when it cuts over here on one strand between the guanine and the adenine, can you see here it leaves sort of like a single stranded area overhang and then also overhanging over here. And so these, these two places, now let me extend that around like this. These two areas where there's single stranded DNA are called sticky ends. and that's a cool name because they really are sticky because um, now that they've formed like this, these extensions can possibly form hydrogen bonds with complementary bases uh, that were cut with the same restriction enzyme. And what I mean by that is uh, when you have these overhangs like this, you can then insert your fragment into the plasmid, especially if the plasmid was, was cut with that same restriction enzyme. And when it's cut with the same restriction enzyme, that, pla that overhang, that sticky end that I'm circling right here, that sticky end will then stick. But in order to completely seal, you need to apply an enzyme called ligase. And if you're familiar with that, that's sort of like your glue. That enzyme is, we've been able to isolate and purify that particular enzyme because that's particularly useful during DNA replication uh, in the lagging strand called the Okasaki fragments and then the Okasaki fragments are ligated together and so we use the enzyme ligase to ligate the fragment into the plasmid and so I really like this diagram check this out so here's your DNA that it can go on and on forever but this is the a close-up of the restriction site so here comes the restriction enzyme. It recognizes this particular palindromic sequence. Ah, it makes the cut. It forms these overhangs called sticky ends, which are capable of hydrogen bonding. This is in the plasmid, right? Okay, so let me just start make it draw it all the way out so there's no confusion. Then here's your particular gene that you want to ligate in. So this has been cut with the restriction enzyme prior. And then watch this, it just get, inserts itself through hydrogen bonding and then you apply the enzyme ligase and lo and behold, you've inserted a uh, piece of DNA into the plasmid, thus recombinant DNA. And so you have this, this new plasmid. Uh, and so this is a, just a close up of the process. You can see the sticky ends are here. And so this allows for, if I were to animate that, this allows for the plasmid to receive the foreign DNA pretty cool. And so you cut the area right there with the restriction enzyme and then you add the, uh, the targeted fragment. And again, you could polymerize uh, chain reaction this particular piece so that there's many copies of it. And then you uh, ligate it into the plasmid. And so genes uh, to be cloned and uh, DNA uh, 
uh, plasmids like this are, are referred to as cloning vectors. And so I've used that word a couple of times in which the DNA, that's, uh, it's basically a plasmid that carries foreign DNA. And then when you transform it into the bacteria, it's able to replicate there. And so thus it's known as, as cloning. And then um, what happens is you could either grow them, the bacteria on a, a, a gelatin material called a, a nutrient auger, and then once those bacteria are identified and isolated as being transformed by the foreign cloning vector, uh, then you can transfer them to liquid medium and uh, agitate them so they get lots of oxygen and then you can grow them up to large numbers. And then you, you would ultimately need to lysis the bacteria and then purify the plasmid from all of the other uh, nucleic acids and cellular debris. And then that plasmid is good for for sequencing. And so how do you know if the bacteria that you're growing is the one that's been transformed? That's a good qu good question. Um, you would usually put in your plasmid some sort of s selection reporter. So in other words, you, you might want to use in your plasmid uh, a gene for ampicillin and therefore grow the bacteria on ampicillin plates. Or you could use um, the lac opron and then you can use chemicals known as X-Gal, which would, would cause the colonies to turn blue if they've had it incorporated in there. So that's pretty cool. We use a, a particular plasmid in my lab that uh, if the insertion isn't successful into the plasmid and the plasmid just closes in and on itself, which sometimes it'll happen, it actually connects two genes that are adjacent to one another forming a lethal toxin that kills the bacteria. So in our lab, whenever we are doing a transformation and we see bacterial growth, we know that those have been successfully ligated because those are the survivors. So that's kind of neat. I was mentioning this chemical XGAL. This is often used in the lab as an indicator for the presence of uh, uh, beta-galactosidase enzyme. And so that could be, that gene can be used in a plasmid as a reporter as well. And so uh, it's important to have some sort of expression uh, vector. And so before I get in, into this notion, let me, uh, let me pause it just for a second here and uh, come at you with uh, a little review uh, showing you some particular uh, short animations of what I've been uh, trying to describe. And so here you can see in this animation here, there's a, a cell that's broken open. So the first step is to crack your cell open and then um, take your DNA out and then find the area that you're most interested in and then apply a restriction enzyme, which then cuts it. Uh, as you can see here, forming sticky ends. Those are the staggered cuts at particular sequences. And so these, these uh, sort of generated fragments are, are the places where they're going to adhere into the right over here and right over here. This is where it's going to adhere into the plasmid. Uh, and so uh, once you have the targeted area, then you're going to need to get a plasmid. And then you're going to need to uh, take that plasmid, uh, apply the same restriction enzyme to it, which creates the same cohesive ends or sticky ends. And so uh, this is sort of what we were talking about just a moment ago, but it's being animated. And then you take your target area and then it hydrogen bonds, and then you apply the enzyme ligase, and that'll form the phosphodiester bonds uh, on both sides. And then you're good to go, which is kind of interesting. And then you have to transform the plasmid into the bacteria, and then you use, as I was mentioning before, some sort of selective growth medium in order to make sure that things are going successfully. Okay, and take a look at this little animation. I'm going to actually play the, the narration to this. This actually has some sound, and I think it's particularly useful. Take a break from listening to my voice. How about that? We can use the techniques of DNA technology to recombine and copy genes. A restriction enzyme is used to cut open a plasmid, a small circular DNA molecule obtained from a bacterium. The plasmid serves as a cloning vector. The restriction enzyme cuts only at a certain DNA base sequence called the restriction site. What I find particularly interesting, I'll pause it for a second, is that you know back in the day, 
you had to uh, create your own plasmids, whereas currently you're able to just simply order these plasmids and they come in the mail. It's pretty convenient, I might add, just to throw in a little commentary there. <laughs> the same enzyme is used to cut up DNA obtained from a human cell. The human gene must be cloned to produce copies for use or study. A bacterium is induced to take up the recombinant plasmid from the surrounding solution in a process called transformation. Now, I'm going to, uh, in a moment, talk a little bit about uh, some complications when you're putting in a, uh, a eukaryotic gene into a bacteria. Um, you have to make sure that there's bacterial promoter sequence in front of the gene or else this won't be able to, you can't just throw uh, eukaryotic genes at the bacteria. They won't, be, they won't be able to recognize it without a bacterial promoter in front of it. This isn't as clear cut as it sounds. Some bacteria do not take up the plasmid and some take up plasmids whose lack Z genes lack the inserted human DNA. A bacterium is placed on a growth medium. It replicates the plasmid at the same time as its own DNA. Its descendants form a clone of bacteria that all have copies of the recombinant plasmid. So that's why it's called DNA cloning, because the bacteria are basically re reproducing through binary fission and thus cloning. The ampicillin in the medium limits growth only to plasmid-containing cells. But which cells have plasmids with a human gene? Bacteria without human genes have intact LAC-Z genes. This allows them to break down a substance in the medium that stains their colonies blue. And that's that exhale chemical that I was mentioning just a moment ago. And so let's take a look over here at this one. This is particularly good. This is, a, this is a look at the restriction enzyme and how that works again. Restriction endonucleases are enzymes that cleave DNA at specific nucleotide sequences. The sequence recognized is often four to six nucleotides long. For example, the restriction endonuclease, ECO-R1, recognizes the sequence G-A-A-T-T-C. The nucleotides at one end of the recognition sequence are often complementary to those at the other end. And so when the enzyme comes along like this, it'll make, it'll make a cleave right there and there or digest the particular area leaving those sticky ends. And then you could then use ligase to come and seal the phosphodiester bonds, which is pretty cool right there. Okay. Now, let me go back to the notes for a second, and then I'll finish up with this, this idea here. Because one of the things about um, cloning that is particularly interesting that I was mentioning just a second ago is that uh, a vector is important because when you're putting it, the DNA into the into a bacteria, you'd want to have this promoter upstream from. Here, let me move it around here. Let me get my drawing tool back. You, you'd want something um, like this promoter upstream so that the bacteria. Um, RNA polymerase will be able to recognize that and begin to, and DNA polymerase will be able to uh, replicate the plasmid and also um, express the, the foreign gene into a, a eukaryotic protein. But there's some issues with that. And um, let me see if I can like mention that. Like for example, you might be familiar with the fact that uh, eukaryotic genes are not the same as prokaryote. In other words, the gene isn't completely useful. It has big regions in between expressed areas called introns. And so what's troublesome about that, and let me see if I can illustrate that, like if you had uh, a particular piece of DNA that you want, uh, this is a eukaryotic gene, th the genes of, of exons, which are useful, could be here, like this, this is an exon, and then it could be interrupted by these other regions called introns. Now, if you were to just splice that piece into a bacteria, the bacteria wouldn't be able, because they don't have the enzymes and the mechanism to uh, use RNA processing. In other words, they don't have spliceosomes, et cetera, to remove introns. And so one way around this is that uh, a biologist could, um, if you will, take, let me see here, you could take your messenger RNA so fully processed messenger RNA that's already been 
uh, treated or edited, and then you could apply an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase would take that edited messenger RNA and transcribe it back into DNA, and that's called complementary DNA. And so this reverse transcriptase, if you're familiar with this, we took this from retroviruses. So an example of that is HIV. HIV has this enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And so when it infects a human cell, it, in, it in, injects its RNA, and then the reverse transcriptase turns it into DNA, and then that, which, that's what causes uh, trouble for the cell. And so we, we've isolated this reverse transcriptase, and so check this out. If, we, if this is the gene that we're interested in cloning into a bacteria, we wait until we isolate the messenger RNA from this, because you can see here the introns are already removed. Then we take messenger RNA in a, in a tube, apply reverse transcriptase, and then that'll copy double-stranded, if we do it twice, we, it'll copy double-stranded cDNA called complementary DNA. And then we can take that and uh, PCR and then use that to mix and then ligate into the plasma. And so we could either use uh, DNA fragments, if you will, or we can use complementary DNA or just pieces that have been amplified by PCR in general. And so uh, one of the way uh, most recently that biologists have avoided some of these complications is that we could, you know, not just use bacteria because they're very useful, they grow very quickly, but as you may know or may not, yeast, which is a eukaryotic cell, or even some single-celled fungi other than yeast, uh, also have plasmids, and they and they also are capable of taking in foreign DNA. And so scientists have constructed sort of you can imagine artificial yeast chromosomes. And so we this these chromosomes can sort of divide normally within the the yeast, and they can actually hold a lot more DNA than just a bacterial plasmid. And one of the advantages of using yeast and DNA cloning is that, not to go too detailed with this, <laughs> but if when the protein is being translated at the ribosome, a lot of the true functionality of a protein has to do with its post-translational modification. In other words, there are enzymes in eukaryotic cells that bacteria do not have that add additional functional groups. It's sort of like a car coming off the assembly line. It's like the details that you attach, like the sport package or the or the or the you know the leather upholstery package or whatever it is. It's those additional modifications that enable the protein to actually function. So if you want a functioning protein, if that's what your lab is studying, you might want to try splicing the, the gene not into a bacteria but into a into a yeast so that it will that the yeast cell will will have those enzymes to be able to add carbohydrates, lipids, phosphates and various other uh, functional groups that will assist in the post translational modification. And so finally, um, let me conclude with this uh, particular video that I again, I find particularly useful in describing the necessity for using complementary DNA. In most eukaryotes, the expressed segments of the gene, called exons, are separated by intervening sequences of nucleotides, called introns. The exons and introns are transcribed by RNA polymerase, generating what is called precursor messenger RNA. And I might add, if I, if, if, again, a little commentary, these introns are actually more numerous than the exons, and so a, a lot of this has to be removed. If I can use the analogy of like if, um, if you're making a film, a uh, Hollywood movie, there's a lot more film that's on the is is being edited than what is actually being used in the in the final production, and so th this this intron material really must be removed. The introns are then excised from the precursor messenger RNA, and the exons linked together to form the mature messenger RNA. Now, bacteria could, couldn't do that, so we can take mature messenger RNA. Prokaryotic cell DNA does not contain introns, and prokaryotic cells are therefore unable to remove the introns from eukaryotic DNA and make functional messenger RNA. Therefore, eukaryotic DNA cannot be cloned directly into prokaryotic cells to make useful eukaryotic proteins.
Before eukaryotic DNA can be cloned into prokaryotic cells, the mature eukaryotic messenger RNA must be isolated and used to make DNA without introns. The enzyme reverse transcriptase is used to convert the purified eukaryotic messenger RNA into double-stranded DNA. The resulting DNA, called complementary DNA or cDNA, can then be cloned into a bacterial cell. Genes cloned as cDNA can be transcribed and translated by the bacterial cell machinery. And so everything that we talked about before then applies. Here's your gene of interest, and then you ligate it into the plasmid, transform it, and you're good to go. <laughs> so um, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully it was informative in some way. And uh, thanks for watching.